to our monthly uh, Global Food and Environment Institute webinar. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be able to open our first webinar of this year. Um, that is, a, of course, also tinged with sadness because it's our first outward facing activity as an institute since the sudden and unexpected loss of Steve Banwa, our institute founder and director um, at the end of last year. Um, I did want to say just on behalf of the Institute staff, we've really been blown away by the, the outpouring of love, respect, condolences for Stephen. Um, we really feel encouraged and, and motivated to continue his legacy through GFEI. Um, I'm Stephen Whitfield. I'm currently taking on the directorship of the Institute in an interim capacity, and that's a huge privilege. Um, I'm going to be working very closely with the rest of the team to deliver on some exciting plans that we have for the next 12 months. So um, do please uh, keep a lookout and, and continue to engage with us. We we do really appreciate your support. Um, so on to today's webinar, um, I'm excited to introduce Professor Fiona Smith, who's an, an Associate Director of GFEI and a professor in the School of Law. Um, she has a particular expertise in trade law, and she's going to be sharing with us today her reflections from the House of Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee inquiry into UK trade policy for food and agriculture. And that's obviously a hugely topical uh, right now. So really looking forward to um, Fiona's insights. Um, just want to remind everyone of the seminar etiquette. So um, please do ensure that your cameras and microphones are switched off for the duration of the uh, of the webinar. Fiona is going to present for about 20 minutes. Um, and as she does, as she presents, please do share comments and questions um, in the chat. Um, and I'm going to moderate a, a Q&A um, at the end of the presentation. The seminar is being recorded um, and the recording is going to be made available via YouTube afterwards. So without further ado, let me hand over to Fiona. Hi. Uh, Thanks, Stephen. Um, just to just to let uh, our admin, everybody know our admin side that I've sorted out how to move my slides on. So this is great. So thanks very much. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to um, present on, on this topic. Um, I'm reflecting on um, the evidence that I gave to the House of Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee um, inquiry on the 6th of, of February. And I think there's a link to the inquiry page if anybody wants to, to look at the specific evidence that I'll be talking about. But I think what, what's clear is the UK is undergoing a really quite strategic period of change uh, since it voted to leave the European Union in 2016. And this change has been particularly profound in um, agri-food trade as the UK is now responsible for deciding its own uh, independent trade policy because this was the trade policy was something that was under the control of the European Union uh, while the UK was a member. Now, when we think about what trade policy, agri-food trade policy might look like. There's two components to this. The first component is the strategic alliances that the UK wants to enter into. So who does it want to trade with? And what kind of relationship does it want with its closest trading partner, the European Union? And the second part of this, and I think it's something we don't pay enough attention to, the second part is how do we want to, to use trade measures to deliver domestic objectives. So when I'm talking about trade measures, the things I'm talking about here are subsidies, so financial payments, food standards, in other words, import restrictions on the basis that food coming in doesn't meet our standards, and protection um, for our farmers if there's a massive, great big uh, surge of imports in a particular product. These are all trade instruments. They're all regulated by trade policy. The third aspect to um, the UK's trade policy as well must be how we as a um, as parliament and, and as a, a civil society and individuals have an opportunity to feed into what UK trade policy looks like. So, so these components, who we trade with, 
how we use trade measures to achieve domestic um, objectives, protecting the environment, things like that. And what forms of scrutiny, transparency do we need to have um, when the UK government forges um, that, um, that trade policy? Now, all of this is very complicated for the UK, not only because the UK doesn't really have a lot of experience um, in, in putting together a trade policy, but also because agricultural policy is a devolved competence. In other words, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland all have responsibility for formulating their own agricultural policy. But trade policy is centralised within the Westminster government. So our agricultural policy and our trade policy need to talk to each other. And this is very complicated. Um, and also, we know that we're undergoing a period of really quite drastic geopolitical change. Um, and on top of that, we have climate change as well. So very, very difficult um, period that we're undergoing. And it's into this that the EFRA inquiry uh, is coming um, to reflect on what um, UK trade policy uh, should look like. So for today, what I'm going to talk about is just briefly um, the, the picture of trade policy up to UK exit uh, on the 30th, on the 31st of December 2020. Then I'm going to look at um, the EFRA inquiry um, and talk a little bit about the questions that I was asked and the, the responses and why those questions were important. And then uh, say a little bit about my reflections on the, on, the, on the process of personal reflections. So between the Brexit referendum and UK actual exit from the EU um, on the 31st of December, 2020, we can see sort of various components of UK trade policy taking place. So the first one was the formalization of the UK's relationship between the EU, uh, with the EU. And as you remember, there was a lot of talk of hard Brexit, soft Brexit, various kinds of Brexit. And this was really about um, the degree to which the UK still retained access to EU markets for its uh, to export agricultural products, because prior to leaving the EU, the UK had sort of free access, didn't have to fill in any forms, um, and it could export tariff free. In other words, it didn't have to pay any taxes for importing its goods uh, into um, the EU. So we finally got the EU Trade Cooperation Agreement, and it was signed literally, I think, on the 24th of December and came into force uh, on the 1st of January 2021. So we really do. Uh, that was really tight. But but actually, we managed to get uh, an agreement whereby the UK was able to export its agricultural products um, free of. Of, of taxes, uh, tariffs uh, into the EU, um, but there was still a lot of paperwork for UK exporters um, to fill in, um, but that is sort of stabilized um, the relationship. The second component that we know is what's called the rollover of the EU trade agreements. So during the UK's membership of the EU, um, the UK was able to benefit from all the trade agreements that the EU itself negotiated with other countries. Now, when the UK formally exit, exited the European Union, technically speaking, the UK would lose the benefit of all these trade agreements. So there was a frantic period between 2016 and, and um, December 2020, where the UK saw agreement from all these uh, countries and said, please, can we take the benefit of the EU's trade agreements um, after we leave? And these are called the rollover agreements. So they're not new trade agreements. They're just continuations of the old ones to benefit the EU. And some of those are now being renegotiated. The fourth component, the, the other component that we that we need to think about is the global component. So the UK doesn't have full control over its trade policy. It still has to comply um, with the rules of the World Trade Organization because the, the UK is an independent member of that uh, body. And the WTO uh, has rules on trading goods, including agricultural products, trade in services, and things like intellectual property that govern um, rights to um, seeds and if you like genetic modification and gene editing, that kind of thing. So the UK submitted its list of agri-food tariffs, input taxes. It's um, the amounts it would allow into the country at lower rates 
Um, these are called tariff quotas, so they're low tariffs at specific volumes, and also the list of agricultural subsidies uh, it was going to use um, going forward. So this went to the WTO on the 24th of July 2018, and the finer bits and pieces of it are still being negotiated as we speak. And as I said, the domestic component is still really important in terms of thinking about trade. And what we see is the UK very much changing the way it supports farmers through financial payments. And we've, we're moving to a system of public money for public goods. In other words, rather than farmers being paid for the area of land um, that they farm, with conditions to farm in particularly environmentally friendly ways. Now we're looking very much at the value added that farmers bring, in other words, their impact uh, on the environment. So we have the UK scheme um, known as ARMS, uh, Environmental Land Management, but we also have similar schemes uh, coming online in Wales, Scotland, and hopefully um, Northern Ireland soon. We do have a process of scrutiny of UK trade agreements, uh, which is done in Parliament. It's a little bit rough and ready because it wasn't really designed for um, the period that we're going through. It's a 2010 piece of law. It doesn't work very well. But what we've had on top of that is two additional um, or three additional uh, committees in the House of Lords. It's the International Agreements Committee. And in the House of Commons, we've got the formerly the International Trade Committee and now the, um, the Business and Trade Committee and EFRA, who are all looking at the UK's trade uh, policy and particularly its trade agreements to see if they're, they're fit for purpose. So that's where we are. So the inquiry that I was involved with um, is really looking at the period of UK trade policy from 2020 onwards and looking at really how it's working and what's missing. So the, on the slide is the, uh, the terms of engagement um, and uh, you can find out more about uh, that um, on the, um, if you click on the link. So what about the session that I was involved with? Well, um, in addition um, to myself, uh, it, there was another trade expert on the panel and uh, another academic who specializes in um, Asia Pacific region trade. Because what the committee was very interested in our session was on the impact of the UK's recent trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand, and also the fact that the UK has just joined a very large trade agreement with 11 countries who have borders along the Pacific Ocean. And this is called the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership or CPTPP. So the committee was very, very interested in this. So the, the expertise on the panel very much reflected um, this, this um, the, the areas that the, the agreement, the committee was, was looking into. So, the questions that we were asked to prepare prior to the oral session uh, were as follows. So how strategically is the UK approaching its trading relationship? Um, and then out of that, has is the UK um, resilient? Is its agri-food sector resilient? Um, is, are these trade agreements good or bad for UK agri-food? What are the opportunities for this new trade agreement that the UK has just joined? And what are the challenges for our trade negotiators? And to me, question one is the most important one because really the others fall, about, fall out of that. In other words, we need to think really strategically about what the UK's approach is to trade, if uh, particularly in agri-food, um, with its links to environmental protection, climate change, food standards, food quality, food safety, we nearly need to think about what the UK's approach is um, before we can really answer these other um, questions. So just taking these, these uh, questions in turn and just saying a little bit um, uh, about them, in terms of strategy, what we've seen with the UK government, the Westminster government, is, is we have seen environmental strategies and we've seen a very limited food strategy and we've also seen export strategies. But what we haven't got is a trade strategy. And to me, this is this is a very big omission 
um, because we've got no sense about who the UK is choosing to trade with, only that we have to enter into all these trade agreements. So trade agreements become important just because they're trade agreements. So there's no strategic direction in terms of why we would choose countries. And more importantly, we're not really thinking about um, how we're using domestic, um, in these trade measures to, to achieve domestic goals. You know, what are our strategic domestic goals? And we're not thinking about the goods that we import from the countries we trade with and the impact that they might have on the quality and safety of the food that we eat, our values as a society, and also our farmers. So that there is sort of patchwork um, uh, thinking, thinking about trade strategy, but we don't have a single document. What we do have is this, this idea that the UK is really interested in uh, a global approach. It's interested in shaping the international environment through its trading relationships. We know that it wants to generate opportunities and increase consumer choice. And we know also that there's going to be a focus on um, resilience and the vulnerability and vulnerability, decreasing vulnerability. And this is important because the UK is a net food importer. It imports more food um, than it exports. The government's food strategy also does link um, the consumption of food with um, health and also with um, the impact on the environment. So we know that the diet has to be sustainable, but again, we don't know about the links between the two. We also know that the UK is equating trade with um, the ability for UK uh, farmers to export, but not about domestic imports. We do know that there is a new customs arrangement in the UK, it's just nicely coming in now, where the UK will um, is going to check the quality and safety uh, of goods on the basis of the risk that they pose um, to um, UK consumers, plants and, and to animals. Um, so we do have some, some structures in place, but, but nothing very much. There's nothing on really on our values apart from the often quoted um, statement, nothing that the government does affects um, our approach to hormone-treated beef or chlorine washed chicken, but not really anything um, else. Now, to me, the, this lack of strategy is really important because of the other questions that come out of this, which I'll, I'll spend um, a little bit of time on. Because what we know at the moment is because the UK is a net food importer, we're very vulnerable to, to shocks in our global supply chains. So we need to think about the conflicts in um, the Red Sea. So the Israel-Palestine conflict is having a direct impact on goods that can go through the Red Sea because of the Houthi attacks on the shipping there. So the shipping, instead of going down the Red Sea, is going all, all the way around, so we're not getting anything through the Suez Canal. We also know um, that the Panama Canal is suffering from drought. So again, you're seeing shipping going all the way around. This is increasing um, costs, um, uh, essentially, to the food coming in at a time when, when food prices are already high. And we also know that the Ukraine-Russia conflict is significantly impacting trade in uh, organic wheat, which um, the UK does rely on. Um, we do import 50% um, of our organic wheat from Ukraine and DEFRA has had to take emergency measures to try and to reduce the import tax of, of wheat coming in for Ukraine um, to try and alleviate that. So we're very vulnerable um, to this. Um, and we know actually that um, if there's conflicts further afield, so say New Zealand-China relationships break down, there's a potential that New Zealand will seek new markets. And we now have a UK New Zealand trade agreement that allows basically in, um, many uh, agricultural products to come in at much reduced um, import tariffs. And if, the U if New Zealand loses its market to China for any uh, geopolitical reasons, there's 69% potential of exports from New Zealand will now come to the UK rather than to the Chinese market. So we do need to think about, about that. And again, when we're thinking about whether trade agreements are good or bad for agri-food, we need to think about um, what our trade strategy is. So 
who are these trade agreements good for? Who are they bad for? Um, so for consumers who might think it's really good, we might get more variety of food coming in. Um, maybe it might, we might have to think about the quality, but we might get more variety. That might actually be better. We might get more access to fruit and vegetables, particularly if crops have failed here in the UK due to, to climate change and impacts of weather. But certainly for farmers, the very worrying you'll have seen, um, you'd have seen uh, newspaper reports, no doubt, uh, and some of you be working on this, that um, particularly the UK-Australia deal, um, the UK government agreed to quite, st quite stringent reductions in import taxes, so the tariffs on um, products coming in, particularly beef. So for an example, um, if Australia wants to export beef to the UK, high quality beef, um, instead of being limited to 3,600 and sorry, 3,761 tons, a, a, a really reduced tariff. Now, it, at the end of the first year of the trade agreement, it can now import 35,000 tons at this low tariff, so significant increases. And in terms of standards, some countries are more problematic than others. So if you think about Malaysia um, and palm oil production, um, we worry about um, palm oil production on deforested land in Malaysia. Now, technically speaking, under Malaysian law, all of that palm oil should be certified as not being grown on um, deforested land. But we don't have any mechanisms here in the UK as yet that will prevent the import of those goods. So we do have the Environment Act that says we're not going to import uh, commodities that are um, a forest risk. But actually, we've got no definition of what forest risk means because that's in a different kind of legislation that's not been enacted yet. So it's problematic. So what about this new trade agreement, this Trans-Pacific Partnership? Um, I think the impact of this uh, on the UK, the opportunities are going to be very limited. The countries that are, there's 11 countries that are members of this um, agreement. And the UK already has trade agreements with 10 out of these 11 countries. So it's only really Malaysia that we don't have a trade agreement with. So there might be some opportunities for exporting high-end beef to Malaysia. And certainly for anybody who loves, uh, who wants to export Scottish whiskey, there's an 80% tariff on um, imports of Scottish whiskey uh, into Malaysia, which will gradually be um, reduced over time. Um, so it might diversify um, the concentration of the UK. So we rely very, very heavily on the EU for our food imports so that it might allow us sort of to diversify over to the Pacific Rim. But but really, uh, the opportunities are limited. Challenges um, really go around whether the UK can continue to ban the import of certain foods on a precautionary basis. So in other words, where there's not necessarily any scientific evidence that a product causes harm, but there's um, sort of quite a lot of growing body of evidence that it, that it may do. So in other words, UK bans on a precautionary basis rather than on the basis of, of risk alone. And certainly some of the legal rules in um, this agreement have been, um, problematic in terms of thinking about the role of science uh, in these trade agreements and how it works. And the final point, just in terms of thinking about this agreement, is the cumulative effect of these um, new trade agreements um, on, on UK farmers. Because every time um, we have a new trade agreement, we have a new amount of product that can be imported into the UK at much reduced uh, taxes than previously. And certainly in thinking about challenges for trade negotiators going forward, we have um, issues to do with Canada and cheese. Um, also, um, there's negotiations with India at the moment where the, there might be concerns about imports of crops that maybe have higher pesticide residues than, um, than we, we allow. And also there's a trade agreement um, potentially with the Gulf Cooperation Council countries um, and certainly their animal welfare rules are, are much different to our own. So then finally, um, just finishing with some of my reflections, I think in terms of the scope of the um, inquiry, 
Um, what we do know is there's been a lot of investigation into um, the scope of, of UK trade policy. What, what can we expect going forward? But what we've not seen a lot of is that the UK relies a lot on voluntary standards um, put in place either by supermarkets or things like Red Tractor, um, RSPCA welfare requirements. And none of these have really come under significant scrutiny uh, in the inquiry. In, in other words, what happens to all the food? Uh, what is the impact on the food produced here in the UK to those standards? So will these trade agreements, will this trade policy uh, affect those in any way? And if so, how? Not seen a lot on scrutiny of trade agreements either. This is an area that is problematic. We don't have a lot of input as individuals and as a society into these trade agreements and into this trade strategy that the government produces. So that's, um, that's a problem. What is good, I think, is the appearing before the committee is less um, problematic or these committees less problematic than it was I think immediately post Brexit what we would see is a lot of tribal disagreements between Brexiteers on the one side and Remainers on the other and it would make giving evidence very politically charged and quite difficult in terms of the kind of opinions you could express that that seems to have gone now so it's much more possible to to be the expert in the room and just just explain what the situation is in a very objective way without um, being classified as a Remainer or a Brexiteer. So that's I think that's very positive. Um, in terms of outcomes, I think the more um, we can have these inquiries, we can see we can actually cast some light on what's happening, and I think that that's really important. So advice: What would I give to myself? What advice would I give to myself? And what advice would I give to anybody uh, contemplating giving evidence? So I think I've got four bits of advice and I'm gonna finish with this. The first piece of advice is it's important to be clear in your responses. So avoid jargon, try not to descend into or, or retreat into your technical expertise. So try to be clear. The second piece of advice is give examples, but not too many, um, and don't speak for too long, uh, which I'm probably a little bit guilty of today. The third piece of advice is to remember that your function is to provide the expert view. Um, so that that is, is, is very much about what you believe. Um, so being clear about what your expertise is and being, and being very uh, comfortable in, in just um, saying, well, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. And if the message is not politically acceptable, well, that's not your problem. And the fourth um, exam, the fourth piece of advice, uh, piece of advice I would give you is be really prepared because you can be asked off the wall questions. So you do get questions in advance, but um, there's always the 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 question that comes out of nowhere that that's quite quite um that, that can be that can throw you but i think overall for me it's a very positive experience uh, and certainly i I'm, i feel quite passionate about about uh, being involved in these processes um and sharing knowledge so thanks very much um everyone thanks so much fiona a really um thought-provoking presentation really interesting to sort of think about how central trade policy is to sort of um, influencing what the food system looks like and how important it is as a, as a lever for achieving the, the types of food systems that we might want. Um, there's lots of interesting questions coming in the, in the chat um, and do keep them coming. Um, I'll do my best to, to moderate. So the first one is from Jonas and he asks, to what extent is climate change influencing which countries the UK signs trade agreements with? Oh gosh, Jonas, I wish I could say it's at the forefront of trade policy, but it just isn't. Um, I think what is interesting is to see the, the recognition that climate change is critical, partic particularly the treaties on environment that the UK has signed up to, what we're seeing now is environmental chapters within so sections, if you like, within trade agreements. And I think that's really positive. But most of the time, um, 
when, a, when the UK enters into a trade agreement, it conducts what's called an impact assessment. And if you look at those impact assessments, they're very much about how many exports can we can we have to this country? What are the what's the trading environment like? Uh, what's the regulation like? Oh, and do they believe in the environment? And what's the farm animal welfare like? So that's why I think trade strategy is so important because um, we need to put um, environmental protection and climate change much higher up and have a bit of a strategic approach to who we trade with. But at the moment, um, we don't have that. I'm going to um, bring in a question from Pippa Chapman as well, because I think this is linked. So she's asking about how the trade agreements link up with UK net zero strategy um, and also undercut animal welfare laws in the UK. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think in terms of the net zero, there are um, in that strategy some talk about the kind of measures we might use to achieve net zero. So uh, one of the one of the things you can use in terms of that is, is carbon trading. Um, but the mechanisms that you use to think about carbon trading or even things like the EU have, which is a carbon border adjustment model, which is paying basically paying tax if you're a, if you're um, if you're producing steel in a, um, a really unenvironmentally friendly way. Um, th these are all trade measures and the, the difficulty is that they're talked about within these individual strategies, but the reality is that these measures don't fit very well in the legal structures that um, that allow them. And, and that talk it is not um, is not happening. On the environmental side, um, sorry, on the animal welfare side, this is really contentious um, because one of the biggest problems in um, trade law is it's very difficult to ban a product coming in on the grounds, uh, on the way that it's been uh, manufactured. So if we think about animal welfare, a cow coming in from Saudi Arabia, let's say a joint of beef coming in from Saudi Arabia, is exactly the same in trade law as as a piece of as a um, a joint of beef coming in from the EU. But clearly, the animal welfare requirements for that animal are very very different. So trade law is always distinguished between these two. So in terms of the UK. Um, thinking about how it might restrict imports on the grounds of animal welfare is really, really difficult. But what you can see is there is the Trade and Agriculture Commission who is required to look into the impact of the UK's new trade agreements on, amongst other things, animal welfare. So it does produce a report and you can see how it's grappling with this problem. You know, how do we not undercut the, the, the animal welfare requirements that, that we've got, it's it's really difficult. And, and as you, I've just seen in the chat, yeah, it absolutely does produce high costs. And that's one of the problems the UK's farmers, farmers are talking about. This is not a level playing field. It's not a level playing field. And, and you're absolutely right about that. Um, and Judith Irons has added some uh, interesting comments in, into that same uh, question about animal welfare. As well, and from a from a, a a buyer's perspective, um, as so well, I'll leave you to to read those, Fiona. Um, uh, uh, Dan Crossley, um, has hi Dan has um has commented with three interesting questions. I think the second of them you've partly answered already. The third question, which is the one I'll pick out, is would a core standards approach, something that's advocated by the WWF and others, um, be helpful? Would that be a sort of advantageous for the UK? Yeah. Um, so thanks, Dan. Um, so quickly on the border checks point, um, uh, they're supposed to be coming in, but who knows? Watch the space, I think. Um, so on the core standards, this is um, something that's been put forward um, by a few N NGOs um, and as you say WWF and the idea is that the UK sets out a series of core standards for environmental protection, animal welfare, quality of food and it, it actually says that it either won't trade with countries that don't meet these core standards or it will actually 
not reduce import taxes on um, products that um, don't meet the cost standards. So you can, you know, you can have, uh, and you do it through various mechanisms. One of which is a tariff quota, so um, a an amount uh, at a lower tariff conditioned on these cost standards. Um, I think it's really worth pursuing this idea of cost standards. I think one of the difficulties we've got now is we've got several new trade agreements without these core standards in them. Um, so it's gonna be a little bit difficult to justify to new trading partners why all of a sudden we didn't have core standards, but now we do. So that might be a bit tricky and depending on how it plays out, um, it could play out if, if we're not extending the same treatment to all countries and WTO members, it could uh, become tricky. It depends on how we do it. So I really like this idea, Dan, but I'm not sure. I think the things may have passed. Um, events may have overtaken us on that one. Great. Um, so you mentioned Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands. Um, Rosie Osborne is asking post Brexit, are we? Um, having to think outside the box, build back up trade strength by looking at countries that perhaps we didn't prioritise or look to before when we were part of the EU? I think that's a really good point. I, th I think initially what we saw was any trade agreement was better than no trade agreements because that indicated independence and it was very much tied up with the politics of the time. Whereas now what we're seeing is a much more strategic approach, I think, um, to looking at where emerging markets might be, where there might be more opportunities for sort of carcass balance uh, in terms of using all the uh, the animals and, and where where might you you actually have new markets so in terms of pacific rim uk's always had relationships with quite a few of those countries with uh through the eu so um if you think about japan there already was an eu japan agreement um that the uk was benefiting from but but now the uk can sort of set its own terms of of trade with with those countries it can negotiate um its own terms of trade so if you look at um the UK Australia deal, there is a, a chapter on farmed animal welfare uh, in, in that agreement, which, which I think is really positive. So I think there, re there are real opportunities for doing, um, doing trade differently, um, but we're just not thinking it through is my, is my point really today. Yeah, um, I'm gonna make this the last question because we're running out of time, but I think it's an, uh, it nicely leads on from what you just said. So this is from David Williams, um, and he's asking about that lack of strategy and, and where it comes from. So he asks, is there a kind of ideological underpinning to the lack of trade strategy, or is it more incompetence or just having too many other things to deal with? And do we think that a change of government might fundamentally change things on that front or not? Yeah, that's a really, really good point, David. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I think a lot of the problem with the trade strategy comes from the, the, the Brexit referendum and the fact that the government really wasn't expecting to win. So there was no plan post Brexit. So I think there's a lot of scrabbling around. So I think a lot of it depended on how organized the various ministers were into getting strategies out and who was thinking about what, how important things were. So I think there was an initial scrambling around. I think the problem with this trade strategy has, has come out of the fact that trade strategy for this government seems to have been aligned with free trade agreements. And those two things are mixed together. Um, and so as, as colleague in Geneva because there's an amazing amazing negotiating team in Geneva at the World Trade Organization that the UK um, group there they are amazing and as somebody said to me they seem to have a trade strategy um, because they're negotiating on all these things and I was like well that's great but where where does that come from so there may well be one out there but we haven't seen it uh, it's not it's not public so um I, I, I don't know. I think I think it's still a bit erratic. Certainly, I do know Labour does have um, a um, 
a sort of plan to have a trade strategy. And I think the, there was a, a speech, I can't remember the day, but they, their, their shadow trade minister has uh, made a speech saying that they would be much more interested in thinking strategically about trade, which I think is very positive. Great. There's lots of questions that we haven't managed to uh, get to. But hopefully, Fiona, you, you might have a chance to have a look through those and maybe respond directly to, to some of the people that have asked them. Um, thanks so much again for a really fascinating um, uh, webinar and thanks to everyone that joined. Um, do you keep a lookout for upcoming webinars and, and other communications through um, GFEI um, and I'll just wish everyone a good rest of the day. Thanks very much.